Hi there, I'm Jack Horrock with Thwink.org. This is an introduction to our research on the World Change Simulation Model. The model was created by adding a change resistance subsystem to the World 3 model of the limits to growth. The title of this introduction is actually our summary conclusion. If we want to make world change happen, then we need to change world models. By world models, we mean models of the world like World 3 of the limits to growth. Later on, we'll explain what we mean by these models need to change. Let's begin by taking a look at where we are today on the environmental sustainability problem. Here's the problem we're trying to solve. This is Beijing, the capital of China, on a smoggy day, which unfortunately is frequent. You should be able to see all sorts of tall buildings in the distance, but you can't, due to the pollution. China's trying to do better and be sustainable, but like the rest of the world, it's failed. No industrialized country, or unindustrialized, is anywhere close to being sustainable or on a credible path leading to sustainability. The entire world seems trapped in an unsustainable mode, one it cannot break out of no matter what it does. It's a grim situation. Meanwhile, researchers around the world are desperately looking for solutions that will work. Like these sustainable rice terraces that are thousands of years old. Solution after solution has been tried. Some have worked in small local cases, but only one solution has worked in the large on the stratospheric ozone layer problem. Despite intense effort, research projects are coming up empty-handed. Nothing seems to be able to solve the sustainability problem. Even the Kyoto Protocol, the world's best hope for solving the climate change crisis, has been a disaster. So what can we do? Let's begin the story of how Thwink.org has approached this problem by returning to the previous slide. This photo represents the problem we're trying to solve. Let's take a deeper look at it from a research perspective. All problems are solved by changing things from where they are now to where we want them to be. This photo represents where we are now. It doesn't have to be this way. Sustainability, even global sustainability, is possible. So the other photograph represents where we want to be. There are many ways we can look at the where we are today state of the system over here. The most common approach is to measure the symptoms of unsustainability, like pollution and resource depletion, and then build models explaining why that's happening and how it can be changed. The World 3 model of the limits to growth is the most famous example of this approach. Since then, there have been hundreds of similar simulation models. Some focus on a single part of the sustainability problem, like climate change or a species of fish. Some, like World 3, Sea Roads, and Threshold 21, take a deeper approach and integrate a broad set of factors into the model in an effort to model the complete sustainability problem. But all this hasn't worked. This leads to our first conclusion. A model is some sort of simplified representation of reality. Every decision we make is based on our models of understanding. Most decisions are based on mental models, like a model of how rain happens. That model causes us to take an umbrella with us if it's raining, or it looks like it's about to rain. Most problems are so simple and so routine that mental models suffice. But some problems are not simple. When the complexity of a problem exceeds the ability of the human mind to mentally model it, physical models are required. Examples are a scale model of an airplane wing in a wind tunnel, a physics equation, and a simulation model for weather forecasting. 
The only way difficult complex problems can be reliably and rapidly solved is with the right physical models. This is one of the very foundations of modern science. Model the problem and your solution will work within the predictive limitations of the model. So what we've concluded is that our present models of sustainability are flawed because they're producing solutions that don't work. Unless these models are changed and the flaws are fixed, the models will continue generating solutions that don't work. And that's not going to take us from where we are today to where we want to be. Here's our perspective on where we want to be. First, we want our models to routinely produce solutions that work. If we make a policy change in a simulation model, and the model then shows that that solves the problem, we want the same policy change to work in the real world. That's not asking too much of a model. It's exactly what model airplanes and wind tunnels, physics equations, and weather forecast models are already doing, as well as lots of other models. These models routinely produce solutions that work. There's one more requirement for where we want to be. Due to how long the sustainability problem has gone unsolved, we're now in pretty serious overshoot. If the problem is not solved very soon, particularly the climate change problem, then various ecological thresholds will be reached. There's a bunch of tipping points, like the melting of frozen methane hydrate deposits, the melting of ice caps and glaciers, and the worst of all, the runaway greenhouse effect. This leads to our second requirement. Our solutions need to work so well and so fast that they can solve the problem in time. That's a pretty stiff requirement. However, it's no different from the stiff requirement that business uses all the time for solving its own difficult problems. What we're saying here is that the physical models must produce solutions of high quality. That's not asking too much. Business does it all the time. Now notice this green arrow. That represents the strategic path we need to take from where we are now to where we want to be. It's a solution strategy. From our perspective, our problem here is not to solve the sustainability problem. It's to solve the problem of the inability of present models to routinely produce solutions that work. That's a different problem. And it's where we focused our research like a little laser beam for the last 12 years since 2001. Let's take a look at our results. Let's expand the little green arrow into a larger one and fill it in. The green arrow is going to be filled in with four steps. Here's the problem we're trying to solve. We need to change the way present models work so that they can routinely produce solutions that work and work fast because once the system starts collapsing and runaway ecological thresholds are reached, it's too late. The environmental sustainability problem has been around for a long time. It was first definitively identified as a serious problem requiring immediate solution by the Limits to Growth Project and Book in 1972. The book electrified the world and the environmental movement took off like a gunshot. Environmental protection agencies were created in most industrialized nations. The United Nations Environmental Program was formed. Countless environmental NGOs appeared. Solution was looking probable. Environmentalism was on a roll. But now, 40 years later, a new realization is sinking in. People are beginning to realize the solutions aren't working. They're being strongly resisted. The human system is refusing to change. This leads to a key insight. Look at the way that ecological footprint is growing. Right here. 
it couldn't care less about what solutions we're throwing at the problem. That's how strong change resistance is. It's so strong, it's the crux of the problem. Until change resistance is overcome, solutions will continue to be rejected by the system. So what are we going to do? The same thing business has done for a long time. This is a difficult problem, not a simple one. So it needs root cause analysis. That's the second new realization. All problems arise from their root causes. So if your solutions are failing repeatedly over and over again, then the reason can only be because the solutions do not resolve the root causes of the problem. No other explanation is possible unless the laws of physics change. These two realizations caused us to build a model of change resistance right here. The core of the model looks like this. This is the change resistance node. That's what the entire model revolves around since it's the crux of the problem. Now remember how the sustainability problem was identified in 1972? That project produced the World 3 model. This is the diagram, the causal loop diagram for World 3. But that model and others like it have been unable to produce solutions that work due to high change resistance. So what they need is a change resistance subsystem. As an example of how this can be done, we've added the change resistance model to World 3. The result is called World Change. As you can see, this is two models in one. The world change model can lead to world change because now resistance to change is built into the model. We can now apply root cause analysis to the entire sustainability problem, which of course is what we should have been doing all along. Resolution of the root causes will lead to solution of the problem and dramatic change. According to the simulation model, it will lead to a mode change. Right now, the system is stuck in the unsustainable mode, caused by dominance of this loop. We want to make this loop dominant instead, so that the system will flip into the sustainable mode. This will happen once the root causes of change resistance are resolved. The system will then want, so to speak, to be sustainable because this loop is now dominant. Over here on the graph, see this peak and the incredibly fast change? Well, that's the industrial output curve. Resolution of root cause forces can change the macro behavior of the human system overnight. For example, think how fast the Industrial Revolution took off once it started, and then think how much faster later revolutions went, like the Electronic Revolution, the Information Revolution, and lately, the Internet Revolution. These revolutions are speeding up. The next one, if we can make the mode change happen, will be the Sustainability Revolution. That revolution will unfold faster than the revolutions before it, probably in about 10 to 20 years. That's pretty good news, because it's exactly what's needed to solve the sustainability problem in time. To summarize, what we've done is redefine the problem to solve. The real problem to solve is how to improve physical models of the sustainability problem until they routinely produce solutions that work. The four-step strategy, one, two, three, four, shows how this can be done. By adding change resistance to integrated models like World 3, <clears throat> we, we can now find, test, and implement solutions that work in the model and the real world. This completes the introduction to the World Change video series. 
The four steps in the green arrow are covered in the next four videos as listed here. Goodbye for now and good luck in helping to solve the most important problem in the world.